Welcome to the Data Strategy Show. My name's Samir Sharma, and I'll be your host for the next 40 minutes. My guest today is the fantastic Christopher Berg. Christopher is the CEO and head chef at Data Kitchen. Chris has more than 30 years of research, software engineering, data analytics, and executive management experience. At various points in his career, he has been a COO, CTO, VP, and Director of Engineering. Chris has an MS from Columbia University and a BS from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Chris is a recognized expert on data ops. He is the co-author of the Data Ops Cookbook and the Data Ops Manifesto and a speaker on data ops at many industry conferences and with other media outlets. Chris began his career at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Lincoln Laboratory and NASA Ames Research Center. There, he created software and algorithms that provided aircraft arrival optimization at several major airports in the United States. Chris served as a Peace Corps volunteer, math teacher in Botswana as well. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Please do like, share and comment. Thank you for listening. Christopher Berg, uh, welcome and thank you for coming on to the Data Strategy Show today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on, Christopher. All right. Thank you, Samir. I'm I'm happy to be here and happy to talk data ops and all thing data with you. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. Listen, um, just just tell us a little bit about your your background and, and, you know, uh, how you got to where you are today. But, you know, at a very 30,000 foot uh, view of it. So, yeah, so I am. So I run a company called Data Kitchen uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, and we are a software company focused on data ops. And so we sort of have been talking about the same idea for in the, in the market now for about seven years, but I've kind of been focused on the problem for 15. And, and really it, it came from, uh, you know, I started my career as a software engineer, worked at companies like uh, NASA and MIT Lincoln Laboratory and Microsoft. And then I was wrote a lot of code, managed a lot of teams. And I got this bright idea in 2005, my kids were young and I thought, hey, this data thing, it's a little bit easier. I could go, you know, I'm a big software guy. I can do this data stuff. <laughs> and you know what? It wasn't easier at all. It was like really hard. Um, yeah. And because, uh, you know, we had lots of data engineers and data scientists and people doing visualization and things were breaking and I kept getting yeah. yelled at, right? Because I was, uh, and so I, I just didn't, I don't like customers yelling at me when things are wrong or late. And then <laughs> there's always the next question to answer, right? Yeah. You, you were never done. Yeah, and so, truth. and the follow up to the next question I always took too long. And then I hired a bunch of smart people, and all of them had their own preferences. Some people liked R, some people liked Python, some people like Click, some people like Tableau, some people like to do visual ETL, some people like to write code. And and so how do you? Um, so for many years I just had to live and learn to manage teams where, you know, where. You, where you don't break things, where you run with low errors, where you try to iterate quickly and you try to give people an opportunity to innovate. Mm -hmm. And so when we sold that company um, and started Data Kitchen, that sort of theme came true to us is that I think that's a generalizable problem. The sort of pain I felt running teams for seven years, I think is um, uh, something that anyone who has data analytic teams Mm -hmm. feel. Mm-hmm. And so um, we had built one version of the software and then when we sold the company that went with it and then we've decided that, okay, this is a general problem. You know, this sort of operational problems and analytics is a big deal. It's, it's yeah. under, um, it's not focused on a lot by a lot of companies. And, you know, we started to call it agile analytic operations and agilitic ops. And we finally settled on data ops as a name. And so we've been talking about it and, and you know, selling our software uh, ever since. That's cool. So, you know, uh, uh, the, the thing that first strikes me is, okay, so what is data ops? And I, and, and I think you've, you've led in with some of the reasons, but why does it matter now in, in today's context? Well, I think the most important idea is that we spend a lot of time talking about the what's in data analytics, what you do, mm-hmm. the data, the model, the visualization, the mm-hmm. governance. Um, and yep. those, are, those are really important, right? But I actually think the how you do things in data and analytics is of equal importance and sometimes more. Mm-hmm. And so think of it this way, um, you know, the factory that runs our system is actually the machine that makes the machine is very important. Mm-hmm. And so it's important because if you can run that factory and produce 
artifacts that are of low errors, like um, you know a Toyota Corolla instead of a 1981 AMC Pacer, which is a very crappy car, um, <laughs> your life is better, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And if, if you can, uh, you know, in, in software, the idea is that if you can get something quickly into your customer's hands and then iterate and learn from it, yeah. the better you're off. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Sorry. So yeah, so those ideas go into um, go into data ops about cycle time and error rates. And then, you know, one of the bigger things in data and analytics is that the teams themselves are all over the place. Yeah. You, know, you have centralized data warehouse teams, you'll have data science teams, self-service analytics is everywhere. Um, you'll have MDM teams who are separate. And so how do you, in this world where there's lots of people and lots of tools and they don't all work for the same boss, and, and how do you make all that work? Um, and to me, the answer isn't to put everyone under one person's thumb and give everyone a, a, a magic tool that does everything. Right. Yep, and, there, and, so and there isn't one. I think it's, <laughs> yeah. There isn't one. And they're probably, uh, you know, there's the, maybe there will be sometime in the future, but like, I just don't believe in magic. Yeah. Right? And, no, and people no, love no. their tools. Yeah. 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 So, um, where, where, okay. So, so I, I, I get the idea that you've got a ton of people. And in my mind, those people are siloed in the data organization already, as you've mentioned. So, you know, yeah. you've got your data, data governance people over here. You've got your data engineers. You've got your data scientists. You've probably got your data analysts somewhere. You've got your data visualization people. So is, is, is data ops the fabric that brings that all together? Um, or, or does yeah, it allow, does exactly, it allow yeah. them to, to efficiently exchange data? Or does it help to build better pipelines? Or, or, or does, you know, to go back to what you said, to to get things into the hands of, of customers early. Is this about early iteration versus trying to get a finished product? So what, what exactly, you know, if someone's listening, because people have heard, you know, there, there's DevOps, now there's data ops, there's ML ops, there's lots of different ops going on. Um, and no doubt there'll be more that will come up. So, you know, what specifically is the the edge that data ops has for a distributed team who have to be good at okay. governance, uh, but have to- well, well, one of these things, yeah, your case of there's data engineers and scientists and governance all over the place, right? And, and one aspect of it is that when you're developing something, we tend to think in silos, like I'm a data engineer or I'm a model, I'm doing my model and I've got my blinders on and I don't see the bigger picture. Right? I'm not connected to it. And the way that we solve that problem now is through documentations and meetings. Yep. And so a data ops idea is give the individual contributor the visibility into the end-to-end -end journey that the data is going on. Right. And so data ops okay. is really about the processes that are acting upon data mm -hmm. and the tools that are acting upon data and less about the data. So if I could make a change to a database table and see the ripple effect of that change in a model or a visualization and say, wow, I broke something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That enables you to get a lot of confidence that when I right. make that change, then can I get that into production with less chance of errors? Okay. And so that end-to-end -end visibility across the system is incredibly important because without it, you're having to replace that with process and team meetings and checkpoints. Yes. And so automating that. Um, and then the other part is if you take that and say, well, what happens not in development, but in I'm running things in production. And many mm -hmm. teams have these meetings that are basically finger pointing. Yeah. You know, the VP looks at the report and says, this looks weird. And is it the BI problem? Is it the model? Is it the viz? Was the data governance wrong? Was the source data wrong? And they convene these meetings on Friday night with 15 people and everyone's blaming each other. And I just found that, I hate that. I just yeah. really hate that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so why can't you build a system that tells you if everything's working before your customer sees it? Mm -hmm. So this and is- wouldn't that free up your time to be able yeah. to do more innovation, innovative things? Yeah, so, so this is more around 
data lineage and the idea that we understand the journey, as you mentioned, but the impact that that data has across different systems and tools and models so that I can um, do early intervention where I feel that there is a, an error um, and trap that quickly. But also, I know that you talk about automation and that it's, it's, you know, it's, it's far easier to automate that process. But so does this mean that we are able to then get things into production a lot quicker and, uh, and are right. able to, to take that heat off um, you know, the, 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 the sort of trying to run and get this into production and 25 teams running around the whole, you know, landscape trying to get, get modules put in and tests done and, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because I think that the idea of, well, why does it matter if you get something sooner, right? Mm. Um, I think, first of all, you need to get something sooner because it maximizes the amount of learning your team does. Yep. And that's a really, as a leader, that's really important because mm -hmm. I have a more of a humble opinion. You know, I've been doing, I've, I've got a 30 year technical career, right? And I still don't know what customers want. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, I think <laughs> you got to put it in front of them. They got to yeah. touch it and feel it. Yeah. Right. And if you touch it and feel it, then you're going to know. And the second benefit is it maximizes the amount of work you don't have to do. Yes. Right. Because yes. that way you think you've got to do 10 things. The customer, when they get something, says, oh, no, you only need to do five, but here's two more. Yeah. So you're net three yeah. of doing it, but yeah. you've actually found what they want. Yes. And so yeah. iterations with the customer are incredibly important. Mm -hmm. and, and data is unlike software in that in software, you iterate in front of the customer, and that's mm -hmm. good. That's what Agile and DevOps are about. Mm -hmm. But you also need to iterate with the data itself because yeah. is it predictive? Can yep. you join the data together? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that sort of experimentation is another cycle of iteration. And the faster you can do those cycles, the better your team is. Because sure. at some, my, my feeling at the very highest level with any value out of data and analytics is a bit of a random walk. Yeah. And, and the faster you can go through the random walk, the more likely you're going to get that nugget of insight that has, has, has it. And all data ops is saying is use your current tools, but automate it. Mm -hmm. Take a, you know, instead of living with the hair shirt of we've got to have finger pointing meetings on Friday afternoon or living with the fact that it takes you two or three months to deploy 20 lines of SQL or a new model into production, mm -hmm. fix that problem. Yeah. And then if yeah. you fix that problem first, it actually turns out you have more time to do more good stuff mm -hmm. and so, more innovation, more, more work. Yeah. So, so. Okay, so I'm an organization. I've got a whole bunch of people doing all of this stuff. What do I have to have in place in order to drive data ops? Well, I, I, you know, I, with a lot of, since it is really about people and process and mm -hmm. less about data, yeah. um, I, I think what we find is there has to be an organizational understanding of the problem. Mm. And so they have to say, look, our customers are asking us lots of things and we're not delivering value and our customers are finding problems with what we deliver the yeah. data is wrong the charts misconfigured uh, there's three versions of truth in the organization and so those two things and then the third is they've got to have some inkling that um it is a people and process problem that comes from maybe the the cio as a, as a general agility initiative in the company and then and, and on the IT side, they're doing DevOps. And then the data and analytics teams goes, ah, what is that? How do I do this? Um, and so those three things, I think, um, and then the once those are in place, then I think we try to actually help organizations with their transformation journey because mm -hmm. we sell the bigger comp companies. And part of it is, is there's a real intuition for people who've been in the data and analytics field when I go in and say, hey, you can go fast and not break things. People are like, whoa, you know, I, I get, uh, people roll their eyes at me, honestly, because <laughs> if you've done it We've for heard while, that before, Chris. <laughs> we've heard that before, yeah, the vendor BS. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so um, uh, there's a certain therapy or unwinding and, and trying to, we tend to talk about the first principles and mm -hmm. sort of we spend, mm -hmm. You know, as an engineer, uh, I like to write code, but we had to do a lot of writing and we wrote a book and a manifesto and 
try to say, if you believe in these principles, you know, um, then um, we have some software to sell you. Sure. Or you don't want to buy our software, just implement the, the principles yourself. You know, sure. we don't care. But like, yeah. you got to believe in the principles. And so mm -hmm. we wrote this 18 point mm -hmm. manifesto. Okay. Um, and, you know, and, and that's, and that, that's helpful, right? If you start to, there's a belief uh, that people have to have, because we're not just selling um, magic software, right? That comes in and does everything. Because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of done with magic software vendors, right? And, and so um, we're saying, look, you got to, you have to think about things in a little bit different way. And cycle time is important. Error rates are important. Collaboration. These are first order problems, not for lesser beings to do, yeah. but actually, and, and even from my perspective, it comes from as a leader, what can you really control? Mm -hmm. And my mm -hmm. journey to data ops actually started back in 2005 when things were going left, left and right in this data system I had inherited. And my first thought was, who can I blame? <laughs> you know, who's the data engineer? The, my, who's one of my employees I can yell at and fire? So when I, you know, I, I have someone, I have a throat to choke. And I started to read um, this guy Deming who did talk oh, about yes. auto manufacturing. Yeah, yeah. And he said this really thing that just like shocked me that in manufacturing systems, only 94% of the time, the problem is due to the system that the people in, that they work in and not the person themselves. Wow. A process cause, not a specific cause. Wow. And if you actually, and I think he, he's, you know, Deming, the Toyota manufacturing system, lean manufacturing, this is standard everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that. And I said, wow, okay. So that, that process that people work in, that's my job. I'm a leader. That's what I'm supposed to be building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I can't, if I'm blaming people, that just means I'm, I'm, uh, I'm denying the work that I have to do as a leader. Yeah, yeah. And so that sort of started me on the path of really, so for me, data ops is really, at least for my own story, it's inter intertwined with my ability to learn to manage data and analytic teams better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot in there. And I think one of the things that I, I keep coming back to is, there's two things that you talked about. One, which was the, um, the, the error rate and cycle time, but the, the other consideration is collaboration. So how does, how does the collaborative effect um, work within the data ops um, journey? And are we, because, you know, I, I asked that question, one, because I see a lot of silos. Two, I see not only silos in the data world, but I see silos from the business side as well. So does that whole, um, and, and we have, and I think people have rested everything on data and analytics recently. You know, everybody's saying if you if you just embed data and analytics into your into your business, it's all going to work well. But then we're hearing on the other side, failure rates are at eighty five percent, and you know, there's lots of statistics that keep coming out year on year. Um, what what what's the, what, what do you see as 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 the core um, parts of the manifesto that talk to collaboration. Yeah, so that so let me like, I'll get to the collaboration, but let me start with the industry error rates and, and yep. the project failure rates because yep. I think that's the dirty little secret in the data and analytic industry is that lots of projects fail and lots of people are changing jobs. Mm. And what's frustrating, at least mm -hmm. here in the U.S. is there's, in the last five years, there's been all these masters in data science programs or masters in information management. And you meet these bright, bushy-tailed people who've got their master's degree, spent a lot of money on it, and now they're a year in and they're like, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> the reality of like life this. just bites them. The reality of life sucks. You yeah, know? yeah. And like, it's not yeah. what they told us. Yes. Um, and, you know, that, and that's for a lot of reasons. Or the average tenure of a chief data officer is like two years. And so, yeah, yes, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so what's, to me, the real cause of that is a failure to acknowledge that the people and process that you lead is the most important thing. And the yeah. way and the methodology to do that is based on the fact, and this, the methodology has been solved already. People have figured out how to do this. And how do you lead a team of people who are all working on a technically complicated thing. 
And so you could say, what's a technically complicated thing? An assembly line for a car. Mm -hmm. Technically complicated, lots of moving pieces and lots of people. Yeah. And so Deming, Toyota, they figured out how to manage people to do that. Right. And they have TQM, there's books. Now, what's another technically complicated thing? Software, right? Software teams went from waterfall to agile to DevOps processes, right? They figured it out. And so all I'm saying is, look, as a leader, you and your team are building a technically complicated thing that is shared among a bunch of group of people. Mm -hmm. So collaboration of those people is incredibly yeah. important. Yeah. And yeah. the lessons that you should learn are to go back and say, look, people have figured this out mm -hmm. and just apply their lessons. And yeah. so in my mind, data ops is just a complete ripoff of, you know, Deming and DevOps applied to data and analytics. Yeah. And I, I think that's a good thing because people have figured it out. Use, use what works. Um, yes. And uh, so that's my, and so whether you call it, data ops or model ops or data gov ops, they're all based in the same set of ideas and principles, which people figured out on assembly lines and adapted to software. And we just need to adapt it to the data and analytics world. And it's, yeah. it's a better way to work. And it's good. It's the solution to the, the 85% of projects fail. Yeah. Um, it's not, don't go buy a new database. Um, no, and I you think know, it's not the latest uh, yeah. two letter acronym to come out of, of, uh, of Gartner. Yeah. And I think, the, I, I think I like the, the the area that you focus on, um, and I, you know, quite rightly. I mean, I've read I've read Deming's work, and I've, you know, certainly seen the TQM piece come out of it. Um, and one of the areas for me is that I, I find that most people in most organisations, whether they are a new leader or that MBA who's just come out, they don't they don't look at the the process or the people. They don't, they don't really understand. They just go straight for the tooling and they will just say, hey, I think if I just plug and play this thing, I'm going to get, you know, my insights tomorrow. Yeah. It's, it, it's total yeah. nonsense. But what I do see is that investment has been done. It's done and dusted in a lot of ways. People have invested in a number of things. And I like the fact that you said, you know, use your tools, keep them, whatever you've got, but we, you know, think of the people in process. What about the culture? How does that um, influence embed? How, how do you make sure that that cultural fabric is also working correctly within that sort of, you know, world, new world order that, that this whole. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's really important. I mean, um, Again, in my journey, when back in 2005, when things were going wrong, uh, I started reading Deming, and then, you know, in early 2006, I formed a quality circle. Okay. And my tool was Excel, <laughs> and so every time we had any problem, we wrote a line in Excel, and yeah. the sheet got big. And yeah. then every three or four weeks, we sat down as a team and said, "What's the one thing we can do on this list to make sure that doesn't happen again?" Right. And and, but. In order to do that, I had to change the culture from a shame, like right. it's your fault that something happened, you're not yep. good enough, yep. to a love your errors culture. Okay. The errors are okay. opportunities for improvement, not mm -hmm. opportunities to shame someone for being a, a lesser person. Yeah. And so I do think the culture matters. Um, and that, you know, and that's the same thing in auto manufacturing. They call it safety culture. Mm -hmm. If you see a problem in safety, bring it up. Right. Toyota gives the and end cord on the assembly line. You can stop, one person can stop the assembly line if something's not right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that sort of, why is that? Because they love their errors. Because if you fix the error once and you, and you fix it in a good enough way, you never have it, have it happen again. Mm -hmm. And that saves mm -hmm. everyone time and builds better cars. And it's why, you know, I grew up maybe 50 miles from American Motors, who's out of business now. It's why Toyota is the largest manufacturing company in the world and not American Motors. It's not that Toyota had better robots or that Japanese people are smarter than Americans, none of that stuff. It's that they focused on the people in process. And yeah. so I think that that's incredibly important and that's the leverage that you have as a leader. Um, and I do think it's um, important. So the cultural part as a leader of an organization is important. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you go around shaming people when, and when things are wrong, mm -hmm. if you um, don't look for 
opportunities to improve what you already have, yeah. um, then it's, it's tough for people to, to do that. I think it's tough. It's tough to make that change because yeah. people then build fortifications of team process around it, checklists mm-hmm. and meetings and sign offs, mm-hmm. um, all of which are the only way that you can survive in an organization where when something goes wrong, you get the dirty look from everyone else on your team. Um, and, yeah. and which is, you know, it's people, it's not unreasonable, it just slows everything down. Sure, sure. And it's less fun to work in that environment, to be honest. Yeah. So, so with the with the trends that you see in the in the industry right now, and you, you touched on something earlier about the you know the, the the CDOs, the chief data officers, who typically you know will will be responsible for that that end to end? Then, I, is it the chief data officer? I, is it somebody else? I mean, the tenure of chief data officers doesn't seem to be that long. That's a whole new other issue anyway, um, and the yeah, investments yeah. I don't think have been. So, so, so where do you think that lands? Is it, it, does it need to be in the IT world? Does it need to be, you know, in the data world? It can, 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 can effectively anyone run it? What, what you know, who, who needs to own well, this it, process? It, it's such a complicated question because mm. there's not one answer, Yeah. right? There are some data organizations who say everything having to do to data from offense to defense, from integration to modeling to visualization to governance is all owned by one team. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's a chief data officer. That's one yep. solution. Yeah. Um, often, more often than not, that's partly done, and maybe the CDO owns the data warehouse and data governance. But there's also these satellite teams who are doing data and analytics on top of it. Yep. Um, and they are work for a different boss, and they have different rules. And so, some organizations to respond that have come up with the idea of data enablement or hub and spoke or, or data lakes where the central team just provides data and tools and they don't really touch what happens in the other part of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, both those are models. I, I guess I take it from the end customer's viewpoint. They don't care if it's one team or two teams or 10 teams. They just want the answer right. They want it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. They want to be able to ask 10 follow-up questions. Mm-hmm. That's what they want. Mm-hmm. Um, they want Amazon and Amazon next day delivery of insight. Yeah. And for many years, I spent explaining to various non-technical people all the reasons why that couldn't happen. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and like, and, and so I just think that you, we should build a system that enables that to happen. Yes. And, you know, the only thing that you can really change in it is the degree of correctness, mm-hmm. getting something 70% right tomorrow instead of a hundred percent right a month from now is immensely better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you yeah. learn more, you get more feedback, you get more time. And so I think building a way to do that and not have your team killed, yeah. not create a data governance mess, not create um, a system where you build a lot of technical debt mm-hmm. and where, uh, and you solve that with automation and testing. Um, you solve that by focusing more on the code that's acting upon the data than upon the data itself. Right. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So uh, what you, you, it, to me, it sounds like this is very engineering focused and very, you know, you talk about Absolutely. manufacturing a lot. You talk about TQM. So is this, re- this, this has really been born out of your view of the world from the, your engineering background and, and, and some of the work that you've. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, it's, it's less about, is a k-means clustering the right model to give for segmentation? <laughs> I, who cares? <laughs> well, I mean, the the, the answer is what's um, the what's the what's the business that, outcome that we're looking for? That's what that's what yeah, I yeah the, the the business yeah. outcome is uh, sometimes giving them a worse clustering, yes, you know, a worse segmentation algorithm first is better because okay. maybe it's just a th- an if then else statement. So the learning and mentality having, around that. The yeah. learning mentality yeah. I have instead of getting the perfect hundred variables that you need to make a prediction. No, I mean, that's customer crazy. Segmentation, yeah. start with two. Yeah. yeah. And then iterate your way to more. Mm-hmm. It may be that 10 variables really makes the best prediction, not a hundred. And so yep. you, what you think you need to be humble about what you think can work. Mm-hmm. And if you build Um, And think of it this way, it is about engineering. And so it's about engineering the factory, the system that makes it easier for you to iteratively deliver insight with low errors in a a highly collaborative way. Yeah. 
And so you need to invest in building that system. It's not free. Mm -hmm. It's not magic. Mm -hmm. And that system, if you build it, relieves you from having meetings and checklists and finger pointing. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. it, 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 and so, and also that becomes a career path for people. Yes. And so in my software career, when in 1999, I had a release engineer who released our software into production on our SaaS, you know, servers in the closet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was actually paid less than everyone else. He played the mandolin at parties and he was fun. But, you know, I was a big <laughs> CTO and I was like, oh, you're, you know, you're kind of a lesser being. Okay. And now you play that forward 20 years and they're called DevOps engineers now yeah. or SREs, system reliability. And they're actually paid more than the people who do the actual coding. Okay. Because the software industry has learned if you build a system that enables people to work quickly with high errors across in a collaborative way, um, that's then you, you, th that system is actually what is of value and what mm -hmm. you're building. And mm -hmm love your errors, deliver with high quality, automate it, focus on the code that acts on the data or code that acts is, is, is all embedded in dealing with the complexity. So it is an engineering problem. And my argument is like, we're spending 1% of our time as an industry on ops tasks mm -hmm. on, you know, on Thursday evening, you know, before five, five minutes before you go home. And I'm saying, spend some time. It's, it's really important. And if you invest in that, spend 10% of your team times, 20% of your team times on the factory, on the automation, you're, it's going to pay in spades later down the line. Yeah. And yeah. Um, manufacturing figured it out. Software figured it out. We just have to figure it out. You know, that's my sort of mission in life is to get people to believe that um, this is actually uh, a fun, interesting value, valuable activity instead of, you know, crap work for lesser beings. Yeah. I, I, I like that. And I like that vision. I think it's a, a, f a fantastic uh, view. Just tell me a little bit about um, the book that you wrote um, and the, I, the, 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 the manifesto itself. W w was that separate or was that within the book? Um, but, but essentially, w did that change the way that people started to think about this, this, this issue? Um, and was that the the realization yeah. for well, many? The, well, for some, yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, the story for us was five years ago or six years ago, we went to our first conference and our name is Data Kitchen. So we wore chef jackets and chef hats and we give out wooden spoons. Like, <laughs> well, well, you're the head the chef, back. aren't you? Yeah. I'm the head chef. Yeah. And, and uh, no one knew what we were talking about. Are you an ETL tool? Uh, <laughs> do you do data science? Are you data lake? And like standing there just day for days oh, being completely goodness. frustrated that no one understood it. And yeah. um, on, the, on the last day, I, I, would, I spent, there, uh, a gentleman came up, I talked to him five minutes, 10 minutes, and he was like, oh, you, you just do, I'm a, I was a software engineer before I do data and analytics. Aren't you just doing DevOps for data and analytics? And I was oh. like, yes. <laughs> okay. And so he, he got it right. That clicked yeah. everything in for him. But yeah. So what we realized is that no one knew what we were talking about. Right. I and so you. we had to write a manifesto and then yeah. we had to, we hired a good writer because my mm -hmm. co-founders and I were not really good writers and mm -hmm. we worked with him and we started to blog and blog and blog. And then we rolled it all the blogs up into a book. And so I've been pleasantly surprised at how the book's free, how, um, you know, there are thousands of, well, not thousands of organizations, there are, uh, uh, thousands of people have read the book. So we've had like 15,000 downloads and companies wow. have taken the book and made it part of their general way of thinking about data ops, right? And, and seen wonderful. this as an inspiration. And so yeah. I, I've been, I found that very satisfying, the, just the idea mm -hmm. dispersal of, of saying, okay, this is possible. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I think in some ways, that's why there's, Lots of companies now doing model ops, data ops. There's mm -hmm. data gov ops companies. I've never data heard of that. That's, I've never heard of data gov ops. This is completely new for me. You know, I think I'm going to have to. <laughs> Blimey, you know. I'll send you. Uh, yeah, well, we, we actually, we started, uh, we started to use that term. So maybe we're com we're adding to the namespace pollution. In okay. <laughs> no, I was about to say, that's a new um, one. Yeah. Next, they'll yeah. come up with DQ ops. Well, I don't know. 
<laughs> well, well, I'll think of it this way. Like, here's a real simple example, and I'll, I'll tell you about it. So you have one database table, right? That's yeah. all you're doing. And yep. uh, you have a model that puts a segmentation in that database table. You have a visualization. Then you have a data catalog on top of it that lists yep. what's in the table. Yep. So I want to go in and add a column to that table. Mm-hmm. And I want to have that show up in the model and yep. affect the model and, and be yep. visualized. Yep. And then I want to have it in my catalog. Yep. So the data ops perspective mm-hmm. is number one, that all the code, maybe it's SQL, maybe it's Python, maybe it's the Tableau workbook, and the governance, the, the, the metadata is all code that's kept in a version control system. Okay. And when you alter the schema, when you mm-hmm. change the model, change the visualization, and you change the data catalog, that's kept and in, in something that's versioned. Right. And then you deploy them. You deploy all the changes at once. And so you, you and change so it in one place as code. Yeah. So yeah, it's one place. It, yeah, one place. And it turns um, instead of having data governance be the sort of bastard child that happens at the end. Yes. With you know, sort of frustrated. And no one wants to do it. To yeah. No one wants to do if it. If it ever happens. You, you say, okay, you're going to change the schema. Well, have you have you deployed that? And yep. where is it in the version control system? Yep. Um, and turn it into a, an activity that the technical people can can do. Mm-hmm. Right. And 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 so and there's great tools. There's lots of data catalog tools out there that have APIs that allow you to do these things. Yeah. And so yeah. um that's the main idea is just treat it as code. Mm-hmm. You know, data governance as code. That's interesting. I've never, that, that I'm going to have to now start speaking to some people about that. Certainly people in my data governance team, that will be interesting. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, and I, it's still new, right? I mean, I've, I've, I've been yeah. talking about this again for five years and like people look at me like I'm an alien. And so, <laughs> um, I mean, the idea is if you can, if you think of the work of a team, yeah. right? And some work is on new stuff. Some work is on fixing old stuff mm-hmm. and some work should be on governance. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. If you want them to work in agile sprints, yep. right? Every sprint that you do should be something new, something to yep. improve something that you've done. Yes. And some governance, maybe. Yep. And, and don't see it at the end. Yeah. See it as, yeah, yeah. Know, maybe, as part of, yeah. maybe, well, yeah, maybe one sprint you do more governance than mm-hmm. less new stuff. Mm-hmm. Maybe one sprint you do more refactoring and improving mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. you do new stuff. And it becomes a discussion with your customer mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. saying, okay, well, you know, we released this new, you really, really wanted this new uh, data set in. So we've got the schema, um, you know, we've got a, a, a sort of a basic visualization. We didn't write a lot of automated tasks. So it's, we think it's right, but we're, we're not. Um, and then the next sprint, he says, okay, it looks good. Change it this way. Um, you know, uh, you add some more tasks. And, and then the next sprint after that, you update the data catalog, right? And it, it becomes part of what the, the team does. Yeah. And so it's just yeah. a choice. Yeah. And I think to me, thinking of things as code and having a code centric view, which comes from my background in software, because I, I, I much more think, uh, you know, I think data is important, but I think the systems and processes and code that act on data are of equal importance. So I, 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 I've, I've heard recently about a lot of companies who are spinning up no code or low code applications. Is yeah. that something that you'd also like to get to, or is that not an option in this data ops area? No, I think, I think, you know, I look at it from an engineer standpoint. So a low code tool is a tool that creates code for you in a nice UI. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. and, and so I think Tableau, Alteryx, Trifacta, You know, um, those are, and there's data science platforms that are, those are all low code tools, Mm -hmm. right? They're just Mm -hmm. UIs that maybe it's represented as an XML file or JSON or YAML, or it ends up compiling like, so so for instance, Talent has a nice Mm -hmm. UI. Yeah. In essence, compiles itself to Java code that Mm -hmm. runs, Mm -hmm. right? It's, it's a, it's a way to write Java code. If you look at it from a a UI perspective. Yeah. And so whether yeah. that code is done in a nice fancy UI or you actually are writing code, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's still code. It's still complicated. Yeah. And yep. in, in our data and analytic systems, we've got to decide where we put the logic. And mm-hmm. so in, mm-hmm. if you think of one type of logic and if then else statement, mm-hmm. 
And so maybe that if then else statement is sort of um, binning your customers. You could put that in the Tableau report. Right. Perfectly reasonable place to put it. Yep. You could put it as an attribute of the dimension of a fact table, mm -hmm. right? And, and then it's, it's persistent in the database. It could be in the thing that you transform the data from. Mm -hmm. Or that if then else could be built from data itself and yep. you end up building a random forest clustering, right? Mm -hmm. And it ends up being mm -hmm. yeah, a fancy if then else statement. Um, and so those are very reasonable discussions to have on where they should go. And I think from my perspective, I think of an if then else is an if then else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be tested. And you know what? When you're in your customer on Friday says this looks weird. Yeah. Who he doesn't care if it's in Tableau or Python no. or SQL no. or no. Yeah, he or she just wants this. it right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And, and and when you want to change the system to be able to get it in the back, that I break that if then else in the front. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. all you care about. Yeah. And so I think you should build automated systems to make that stuff happen. And it's worth it to do that investment because your team ends up being more pro productive. They end up being happier. Um, and it, and I, like, I just, I don't ever want to work in the other way. Cause I, I hear people, I, I talk to people and the hair stands up on the back of my ends. Cause it yep. brings back my, my days of, of hating my life, you know, driving mm -hmm. to work, waiting for that email of, oh, the data is wrong or going yeah. to meetings with customers yep. and having them roll, roll their eyes when we say it's going to take three months to have a follow-up question. Yeah. Like, it's just really bothering it, it shouldn't <laughs> happen, should it? You're I, right. I just think there's a better way you're to right. do it. You're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Uh, Chris, it's been fantastic. My final question. If you were to wake up tomorrow morning as a superhero, what would it be? Which superhero would it be? You know, I've always been a, a fan of Spider-Man. Ah, you know, look at that. And, you, know, hey. you know, I've always been more of a Spider-Man <laughs> guy. You know, he's sort of a nerdy, yeah. takes pictures, you know, just the girl. I've always been kind of, yeah, Spider-Man's my favorite. Uh, that's me. That, I, I love that as well. <laughs> that That's exactly, my, my, my daughter asked me, so what? who's your favorite? I said, Spider-Man was always my favorite when I was a kid. You know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He's, he's like the patron saint of nerd guys. Like he's a nerd, <laughs> he takes pictures, he gets checked, and then he gets superpowers. Like absolutely, wouldn't, why you know, wouldn't you? Who wouldn't yeah. want to be Spider Man? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Look, Chris, it's been a fantastic uh, time uh, spending spending this time with you, and really, really great insights. Thank you so much for for all of your. Uh, uh, knowledge and experience uh, that you've gained over the years. And thank you. I oh, so no, no, appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity to, to chat. That's a pleasure. It's been very fun. Thank you.